Hey, this is Vernon Reed from Living Color, and you're watching the Helix Hour. Welcome to the Helix Hour, brought to you in part by Design39 Media. Visit design39media.com for all your website, photography, and video production needs. Microphones for the Helix Hour are provided by Rode Microphones. Now, let's talk some Helix. Hey everyone, happy, beautiful Sunday afternoon to you all. Welcome to the Helix Hour. We are live. Internet is cooperating with us and all the internet gods are smiling upon us. Joining us today is a guest we've been looking forward to having for quite some time, from Reba McIntyre to Kelly Clarkson, Shania Twain here in Canada. A lot of you know uh, Took, which is, uh, is a project I'm really thrilled to learn more about just uh, today, as a matter of fact. But guitarist and Line 6 artist, Corey Cherko. Corey, how are you? I'm doing good. How are you, Eric? Fantastic. Really, really good. We've done some test calls. Everything's working really good. It's one of those things I don't certainly don't want to jinx uh, ourselves here, but would knock on wood. Uh, things are going good, and it's it's nice to have you. Know you're on the West Coast. You're out in Vancouver, correct? I'm actually in LA. I've been living in LA since 2001. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, well, it's still West Coast. There you go. But you're Canadian boy, Canadian born and raised, right? Totally. Yeah, I moved I moved down here from Vancouver. I was there for about 13 years. Before that, I was on the prairies in uh, Saskatchewan. Oh, fantastic! So that's that's. A th- I was just assuming you were still Canadian. I had, didn't know that you made the move. But uh, how's how's life down there treating? Obviously, the weather is more consistent than what we have back home. Gotta say, the weather doesn't suck. Yeah, I mean, it does suck for two months in the summer. It gets like out of control, hot. So, uh, like like all the plants just wither up and sort of just they just they go limp. Yeah, but uh, the rest of the year it's just sunshine. I mean, compared to Vancouver, which is probably the nicest place in vancouver or in canada for for climate yep uh you get way more sun and uh consequently my mood is a lot better yeah <laughs> i've only visited vancouver area once uh, before my dad passed away he had a sister out there and they lived out in uh, seashells and on the sunshine coast area and we went out there for an, uh this was like pre 9 11 and everything too so you know you could when you're flying out there you can go say hi to the the captain and all that kind of good stuff it was about a two-week trip out there and just loved it. Now, it was quite rainy, you know, like a lot of that weather you get out there, um, but beautiful green, green, green like I've never seen before and a lot of forestry. It was, just, it was a really uh, awesome trip. It, it's, it's a beautiful part of the world for sure. And, and when the sun comes out, you realize what all that rain has actually done, you know, and, and why it's so beautiful there because of, because of the rain. Yeah, it's worth it but, for sure. It truly is, you know, for that just that life, right? And clean too. I mean, just the air. I, I mean, it's been a lot of years since I've been there. I'm not sure if it's like smoggy now with like you know big metropolitan cities and stuff like that. But of course, where we were wasn't in that area. Just beautiful fresh air. You know, just it was nice. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Loved it. I'll, I'll gonna say hi to a bunch of people over in the chat here. Then we're going to come back and we're going to kick off the show talking about Tuke. And, uh, you know, it's one of those things where I always, I never, ever, ever, when any, any of my shows profess to know everything about my guests that come on the show. You know, I sometimes I learn uh, with you or with the guests each week, but I certainly do research to be, you know, somewhat in the wheelhouse. And what I found about Tuke, man, oh, man, I'm so glad I discovered what Tuke does. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but Jason Wade is here. Jason Wade is one of our new moderators here, a good longtime friend and longtime viewer of our different shows. He's now a moderator with us as well. So he's saying hello, everyone. I uh, hope everyone's having a great day so far and ready for a great time here on the Helix Hour. Coffee Lover is here. Another uh, Brian Cazell, another Helix user. Uh, Quentin James is here. Hey, kids. Nocturnal Butterfly is my better half. It runs a chat efficiently as well. Bob A. and Carl Santa, another fellow Canadian Helix user and friend. Ricky Mees, Bam Mozzie. Rich Stellman is here. Kai Down. Lots of people from the uh, Helix community, the Line 6 community. Uh, let me see here. Scroll down a little further. Uh, Frank Rashot is our good friend from resident from Line 6. He's here as well, too. Um, yeah, with lots of support from the team back home there at uh, in Calabasas. RJ to Mad One is here, and uh, Todd Graff is here. Okay, so I'm going to, and Cyber Evil is here as well, too. Joe Hervey, a bunch of people jumping in. I'm going to highlight right where we left off there. Okay, so, so Took. I, uh, we, the boy in, uh, convinced me to hear Junior, my son, he's a musician as well too, young youngster. He convinced me to get this Apple Music thing, right? So I get Apple Music and I haven't really taken advantage of it yet. So I'm today, what's the first thing I type into Apple Music? Tuke. I type in Tuke and I, c- I come across the uh, Giver. Is that the name of the, the album? Yep. Okay. And all these covers. Comp- yeah, all these, uh, all the, and that's kind of a Canadian thing. I think we say that a lot. Maybe it's, it's in the U.S. as well too. But Giver and Get Her Done and all the kind of crazy stuff. Uh, yeah. 
but the music I heard, these covers, and I, I called Nocturnal, who's Sandra here. I said, come down here, come down here re- really quick. And I'm playing with the Kim Mitchell stuff. I'm playing with some of this other stuff. And uh, like, t- tell us a little bit about Took, what, what the entity of the band is, when it came about, and how it came about. And we'll talk more about this cover a little bit. Well, Took is myself, um, two guys that play with Slash currently, Todd Kearns and Brent Fitz. Now, who's that Slash guy? I've heard him. He plays guitar, right? Yeah, slightly some guitar player. He's, you know, you may have heard of him. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of famous. <laughs> and then on drums, we have Shane Gallus, who played with the supergroup in Japan, Bees. They're like the Rolling Stones of Japan. Okay. Um, and all four of us are from the prairies in Canada and have been living abroad. You know, uh, two of us are in L.A. and two of us are in, in Las Vegas. And Mike Myers, the comedian, once said that there's nothing more Canadian than a Canadian living abroad. Okay. And we always long for home. You know, we long, where can we buy pierogies? Where can we get poutine? You know, all that kind of stuff. So uh, every, anytime we got together, we were like, oh, remember that, that Canadian tune by Toronto? Or remember the Queen City Kids? Remember Street Heart? And we're all like, you know, uh, songs you just don't hear down here anymore. Um, and we decided uh, when we got asked to do a, a charity event for breast cancer up in Winnipeg, um, that was the time when Brent Fitz said, hey, we should all get together, play this event, and make it a Canadian theme. So all we play is like old Canadian rock from the 70s and 80s. Uh, we did that like two or three times. It went over like gangbusters. And we decided, well, hey, now we have to make an album. And that's what Giver is. So Giver is our first album okay. uh, on the Duke name. We had different names before that. We were called Coverboy at one time. Coverboy, I like that. <laughs> that's a good one. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's really just a celebration of Canadian music. Um, we, you know, we could call ourselves a cover band. We could call ourselves a tribute band. But really, it's just four guys who have done quite well as backups and, 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 and you know, solo artists as well mm-hmm. in, in the rest of the world, bringing out this Canadian music that no one else in the world has ever seen before or, you know, or actually, I guess, heard and uh, and bringing that out to them to hear it. To them, it's all original music. To the Canadians, it's, it's just a bunch of cover tunes. Yeah. You know? But the cool thing is, yeah. even some people that may say, that you may think not a lot of people have heard these songs, they might not be on the wheelhouse of everyone's you know, top playlist, in some cases outside of Canada, things like that. But they're so, they're so diverse, and they're, they're so popular, I should say, that it, you, they might be like, I heard that somewhere. Maybe I was visiting Canada. Maybe I have a, whatever the case may be. But they're catchy enough that some people outside of the wheelhouse of Canada I'm surely have heard them. Some big hits. Exactly, well, like Loverboy and yeah. Alden Bar, who was uh, writing songs with Bon Jovi back in the 80s. So, yep. uh, April Wine, a lot of my friends have heard of April Wine. We do uh, Roller on the Giver album. Yes. I adjust this cable here because, oh, there we go, I wasn't charging. There's, there's a band that I never talk about on the show, and uh, some, some of the, our viewers you know, from the United States and that may not even know the band, but a band I love to death. And I'm not embarrassed to admit it because some people think, well, you don't, you, don't you like Van Halen, Eric? You don't like these, you like this other band? I like Platinum Blonde. I love Platinum Blonde. And you do Crying, right? We do Crying. That was Absolutely. good. That was good. And the, you owned it. That's a, that's a question I'm going to ask you. Um, what was the thought process going into it? Did you, A, did you like, okay, let's just, let's just do these covers and do a tribute and like kind of preserve them forever? Or did you want to put your own spin on them? To me, it's almost like... Like uh, it was like a you know we talk about these modeling things and and a, d- a DNA sample of music. I think you guys kind of took a DNA sample of that music. Obviously, with new musicians playing it, what was the thought process in actually capturing it? Right. Well, we could have done our own versions of these songs, but these are all songs that influenced us, us as kids. Um, they we cut our teeth on these songs, so to to even change the guitar solos is like changing the lyrics to a song. So we wanted to sort of do the songs verbatim, like the production that they, they had originally, and then just give them newer sort of modern mixes. Nice. Now, uh, I know you're, we're going to talk like gear like wholeheartedly here soon. We're going to talk about Helix, and I know you're using Kemper and things like that as well too. We'll talk about all of that, but can you kind of share some of the, uh, I'm going to focus more so on guitar at the moment. Um, right. How did the studio process go? Were you using real amps there? Were you using modeling or both? On the Tuke album, it's all uh, Kemper and Helix. I, I didn't use any real amps uh, at all. Well, you know, they're kind of real amps because I actually profiled them into the of Kemper course. my real yeah. amps. Um, the, the, the most, most of what you hear on the Tuke record is a, fr- a friend of mine just down the street actually has a 
super nice modded Marshall. Mm-hmm. And so I went over to his place and, and uh, took a profile of it one day. So, yeah, everything is digital. Nothing is um, old tube amps at all. That's great uh, to hear. Yeah, it makes things a lot easier if you have to, like, if you go, oh, I totally botched that solo. You know, the next day you always hear things differently. Yeah. And you don't have to worry about tube sounding different or the mic getting bumped or, uh, you know, the temperature even being different. It's all So many solid. variables. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the thing, for, and especially, too, for people that aren't engineers. You know, if they want to record at home, uh, like myself, I'm a perfect example. I can't get a good mix with a microphone to save my life other than speaking. I you know that's good enough. Now, live, I was okay. I went for my bands that I always played with. I was pretty much the designated sound guy, and I could get a good live mix there. But recording is a different environment. I think some people might argue that, but I just can't get the sound. So that saves a lot of people, uh, people's time and energy and all that kind of stuff. It's funny, too. One of our previous guests we've had on the show, another major uh, Line 6 artist, is uh, you may know him, maybe friends with him, Chris Robertson from Blackstone Cherry. And he had, he had told us um, that how his approach was to Helix. The last two records that they did, all the guitars were Helix, and they had uh, you know the world of amplifiers at their disposal. And I, if I remember the story correctly, how he uh, kind of related to us, he said, you know, he was, wasn't getting the sounds he wanted. And he talked to the engineer and the producer. He said, like, do you mind if we just try this, this Helix thing? And they tried it and got it. And all the bass tones were done with, a, you know, your traditional Ampeg SV, you know, SVT, uh, you know, 810, whatever. I don't know what the head was, but it was obviously an 810, probably an SVT. And um, they at the end of it, they're like, mm, this, something wasn't there. They ended up using the Ampeg and Helix and kept the Ampeg and Helix. So, I mean, <laughs> that's kind of funny. Nice. Yeah. Well, that stuff happens all the time. And, and a lot of people will record with this stuff in the studio, and then they'll say, oh, I used my Marshall or I used my Bogner or whatever, you know, just to make it sound cooler for some reason. You know, they think the, the vintage stuff is a cool way. But I've always been a sort of cutting-edge kind of guy. I love technology. I love tweaking. I love to know what technology can do for me. And certainly, uh, especially the Helix, man, that thing is robust. There are so many, so many things you can do with it so many ways you can use it it's amazing i know i'm just scratching the surface on it myself right now too and i always try to tell people when i'm doing some demos just like i did earlier i did a a native demo about an hour or so before the show here and uh it's just the it opens up creativity um like like i said too if you don't have the engineering background to be able to record and stuff like that like i would come in here and i have a mic sitting on my 412 behind me right now it's mic to the same mixer running right now and some days it would sound okay other days, maybe with my mood or whatever, or maybe like you say, environment, temperature, blah, blah, blah. There's so many factors. It's like when you get the uh, inspiration to do something, whether it be record or just jam, you know, you want to act on that. And you certainly don't want to have anything taking away from that inspiration. And that, that killed me with the internet. I was trying to do some demos and the internet killed it. But take that aside with the technology that we have today. The only thing that really changes from day to day is your mood. You might be in a good mood one day and a bad mood the next day, but whatever you know you're depending on for sound is going to be there consistently you know whether that be helix whether it be Kemper or, or head rush or you know boss or anybody right the technology is going to stay the same for you every time you use it i love that yeah, yeah it's that consistency that i really love as well uh, especially when i was doing a lot of fly dates where you can only take your pedal board and you can't take your amp right because you can't fly with it mm-hmm. so you backlight the amp, but then you get a crappy amp and it's you know it's got different tubes in it or you know it just it never sounds right. It's been beat up by wh- whoever used it last. Uh, when you have Kemper, you have Helix, you have exactly what you had in the rehearsal space at the gig. There's no no second guessing it. If you get a bad amp, it can throw your whole game off. You're like because you'd be like, it doesn't sound right, and you're forgetting what you're doing. You're not giving your all to the performance. Yeah. And so it gives you peace of mind when you have stuff like Helix to to just rely on. It just works. It doesn't. I agree with that. That is the thing, because being that I used to work in several music stars where we would supply backline for touring acts that would come through the city, you know, some like obviously the the staff would try to keep the amps, you know, up to, you know, tubes good, you know, power supplies, all that kind of stuff, speakers all good. Um, But you never know sometimes whoever rented the stuff out before, how they took care of it. You only have so much time to check it out. And I hear the thing consistently with guests that come on my show. Uh, or all of the shows when we talk about gear it's like you know they, they want they want a jcm 800 or whatever they want it for the back line and sure they might have one but what's it going to sound like as soon as you turn it on right and it's just like you say if you're one of those guys or girls a musician out there that depends on your consistent tone uh and it's a train wreck from from the moment you take it off a of standby you know it really it, your your work is cut out against you before you even hit your first note 
Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. Let's go say hi to a few more people when we come back. I um, I know that you've got another single coming out from Tuke. We'll talk about that. I saw both Todd's post and I think you posted on your Facebook as well, too. We'll talk about that. It's coming up soon. So back over to the chat. We've got uh, Joe Hervey here. Uh, I mentioned Bam Ozzy. Will Varela is here to stop by to say hello. Uh, LCE Music. Hey, all. Uh, new Tuke music coming out this coming Friday. There we go. Awesome. Uh, check out He's your... our manager. <laughs> What's that? He's our manager. Uh, right on. <laughs> LCE <laughs> what's, what's his first name his name's Lyle Lyle nice to meet you Lyle fantastic very cool so there we go we're going to segue right into that in a second as well too um, Nocturnal Butterfly that's my better half she says it will blow your mind I got I got her interest in it very quickly as well too uh, and I, we have that linked as we got a whole bunch of links for you today. Some of our guests, we got a couple links for you. We have like a thesaurus of links, for both to Tuke and, uh, Instagram stuff and uh, all kinds of good Apple music where you can actually buy the music and so iTunes and stuff like that too. So fantastic. Uh, Todd Graff is here as well too. Django Amadeus is here, uh, two in one day talking about shows. Sometimes we have to stack these shows up. We have to go when the internet is good. Uh, Scott Connor is here as well too. Quentin James. And, uh, yeah, he likes the name cover boy. I think that's very cool. He, he plays a lot of covers on his YouTube channel just just to just to kind of uh, kind of piss off the copyright uh, YouTube people just does just strictly to get at them and he plays a lot of music from everybody and as soon as I heard these covers I sent him a Facebook message I said dude check this out so I know he's uh, he's enjoying it Evan Ward is here uh, I'm gonna scroll down towards the bottom okay I'm gonna go backwards here R2 R3 Locknet is here Sonia one of our moderators is here let me see here uh, Denny Allen is here Bobby Clipper is here great full house of uh, fans of not only uh, of yourself, but of uh, Line 6 products and whatnot as well, too. Uh, Frank Rashad, that is so cool. Let me see here. I think we've got just about everybody. I haven't missed anybody else. So let's talk about uh, the new single, and what can, what can we expect from the single? Well, the single is, and I can't say the name of it. No, that's fine. That's fine. Yep. We're having a contest right now for people to guess what it is. I mean, a lot of the people in the world won't know what the song is even when we do announce it. But for those that do know, it's always kind of fun to get people guessing. And there's a lot of smart people in the world. I just, <laughs> let me say that right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's hard to pull anything over anybody's head. But um, So yeah, it's, it's, it's the first time that we actually had a, had a couple of guest artists on a Tuke song. Uh, one of them is my dad, because my dad was the one who got me started playing guitar, taught me everything I know. Uh, we played in a, a family band together when I was, you know, since I've been seven years old and then uh, I think we went until I was like almost 20 years old. We recorded a lot together, but we haven't done anything for like 30 years. So we actually played a, a guitar mini solo with me on this particular song. Um, it's uh, it's coming out May 3rd, so you can watch. It'll be available on you know iTunes, Google Play Music, Amazon, Spotify, all those all that stuff. So um, you got to stand by, watch for the uh, the hints as to what the song is. And we're going to do the reveal to the final, uh, the second guest artist uh, on Thursday, Thursday morning. Well, that's good. I'll share that for sure when it's out as well, too. I'll put that on our different platforms as well. Let's. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned it, your dad, because I didn't know that, that story there. Let's share that a little bit. I, I've had several guests on here where they've had the musical dads. You know, I've been a real catalyst, sometimes moms, too, uh, in, in people's careers. Um, kind of tell us a little bit about your dad's upbringing with guitar and maybe with the bands he was playing in. And kind of when did that kind of give you the bug? Well, my dad and my mom had a band. Nice. Growing, and it was a dance band, a wedding band in, in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. Um, we, I was pretty young at the time, but, you know, I'd always watch them rehearse. And eventually they went through different configurations of personnel in the band, and it eventually just kind of fell apart. Mm -hmm. At that point, my brother was already playing drums. Uh, my sister was already playing keyboards and flute. I was still pretty young. I was about seven, so I was I had started piano, but, um, you know, I was just, had only a couple of years of it. So I, I just sang. And uh, basically, we, he just said, hey, you guys want to uh, play for my sister's wedding? So we played at Aunt Delphine's wedding. Hi, Aunt Delphine. <laughs> and uh, made, made 20 bucks. That I like held on my hand all the way home. First professional gig? My hand. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, my first gig. I should have put that up on the wall somewhere. Yeah. Uh, I think I spent it pretty promptly. I'm sure you went uh, as a young kid. <laughs> yeah. And we became real popular in the Moose, Moose Jaw area. And decided to take it on the road. And uh, at the age of 12, I actually left school, took all my school by correspondence. And we went around Canada, like all over the place, playing nightclubs and taverns and bars and wherever we could get in uh, underage. Yeah. Because provinces have different liquor laws. That's in right. Ontario, we spent a lot of time 
where I think you're from, right? Yeah, that's right. 19, it was 19, I, I can't remember how far back, but I think it's been 19 for, for forever, I think. Yeah, it's 19, but you can play uh, legally in any bar underage as long as you leave on your break. Exactly, so, and I was playing at 16 as well. Exactly, you'd be, you'd be in the kitchen mm-hmm. or outside up in the band, band rooms that were above or wherever, but you know, we, we cut our teeth playing in, in a lot of bars, and I think that's what's uh, been so beneficial to me over the years is having, you know, copying all these parts, copying the sounds, getting this big repertoire of old tunes, um, and sort of set me up to be, you know, the ultimate cover uh, musician playing, you know, copying parts for Shania, copying parts for Kelly Clarkson, you know, that whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. So my mom and dad were in the band and my brother and sister, and we, we played that way for many, many years. Do they, they still um, tinker with music? Are they still involved? My mom's busier than I am. Re- she, she really? Plays, oh, yeah. She's got like three bands or something like that. Wow. My, dad, my dad's actually doing a, a, a thing right now, kind of a Broadway thing. Um, he says like there's a, there's a chord every beat. So okay. <laughs> he says good workout. Yeah. Lots of altered chords and whatnot, jazz chords. Uh, so, yeah, my brother, I mean, he's a big time producer in, in Las Vegas. You know, he's... Uh, Platinum selling uh, metal producer uh, produced two two uh, albums for Ozzy Osbourne, uh, Me- Five Finger Death Punch, uh, you know bands like that. Disturbed, I think he's done two albums for Disturbed. That's so, quite the musical uh, yeah, family. Yeah, and my sister plays with my mom, and then my my niece plays with them. So yeah, everybody's still doing it. Okay, that's not fair to have all that talent in one family. That's nice, though. That's nice. You know, you can all feed off of one each other, inspire each one another. That's that's fantastic. I love that. Yeah. You know, you know what's weird today too with the generation that we have today. It's a good thing and it's a bad thing with all this. You know, the Instagram technology and and, and YouTube as well too. We're seeing all these phenomenal musicians around the world, um, and some play out, some don't. Um, but like you say, you know, you cut your teeth in the clubs. You know, like you know, some some of these clubs are aren't exactly. Uh, a safe place to be or a fun place to be, you know, it's one of those things where you actually want to go hide when you're a young kid, you know, I'm sure in some of those places, but you know, you did cut your teeth, uh, in front of good crowds, bad crowds, everywhere in between. And where a lot of musicians today that have a wealth of talent, they don't, their only experience that they know is playing for a camera or, you know, playing on their couch or their side of their bed or whatever. And it's a whole different ball game when you get out there. And I, something I say to a lot of people is, Try your best. There's always an open mic night out there somewhere. Um, you know, clubs are dying, especially here in Canada. I know it's probably the same everywhere, but here in Canada, they're washing up all the time. They're, just, they're shutting their doors and blah, blah, blah. But get out there and do an open mic night. Maybe find some more, more musicians that you might not discover and uh, jam because it's a lot different standing up and playing than sitting down on a, on a stool. You know, would you agree with that? Totally. totally. Yeah. In fact, when I rehearse for a gig, you know, I'll learn the songs sitting down, but as soon as I got the parts, I stand up because exactly right it's a whole different thing when your guitar is at a certain height mm-hmm. um, and depending on what style of music if you're if you're playing like hard rock or something your guitar is kind of going to be pretty low mm-hmm. it's like a new instrument down there and then when you get in front of an audience that adds a whole new element to things um i, I always say it's it's a new gig from the time you learn the song to the time you stand up to play to mm-hmm. the time you actually play in front of people you get the lights on you uh, there was a guitar solo that I played in the Shania thing uh, from this moment on, which has a really nice guitar solo on it. And I had it perfect. And then the spotlight came on me to play it for the first night, and I couldn't see where I was. Oh, jeez. It was washed out. Yeah. Or, or the next night, the spotlight didn't come on at the right time. So when I was in the dark, <laughs> you know, so it, and it takes a while to sort of get used to, okay, what are the variables that can happen? And what, what am I going to do about that? when they do happen in order to nail this. Yeah. I, I remember early, yeah. earlier into my career with the one band, it was like probably the band that I put the most work into is with a band, uh, Canadian band for about 12 years. And I used to always wear my guitar almost like a necklace. It was like up so high, you know, like, I mean, I could, I could do right up to 20 second fret. No problem. And this, we kind of, we didn't, you could hi- play though, right? Oh, I could play. I could play. It was comfortable. It was great. <laughs> Look crazy. And I, I dressed horrible. And thanks, thank God for when uh, my better half came into the picture. She became, she eventually became the band manager, and you know, changed the band's wardrobe for the better, changed my appearance for the, uh, for the better, stuff like that. But we did talk to this one consultant from L.A. 
and uh, he's, he's a great producer, Nick Nolan. His name came up the other night on the show when I had Blue Saraceno on the show. And uh, Nick Nolan kind of looked at us and said, he looked at our pictures. He's like, first thing you're going to do, you drop that guitar down like 14 inches, you know. And so I, I, I did that. And sure, it looked cool. Like I'm almost like the Ramones now. And it, it almost sounded like I started playing guitar that day because everything I could wow. do, I'm like reaching and I couldn't do those solos because I'm, I'm always up, you know, from the 12th fret to the 22nd fret. And that, that's my comfortable spot. And uh, trying to reach those notes is just like, oh, my God. And so it does take a lot of uh, transitioning. And I like you're saying, too, when you can't see your fretboard, that's why I don't like guitars without f- fret markers. I, I you know, I'm, I'm not afraid to admit I need them. And even if you have them on the side, you know, if you can't see and I like to see where I'm at, a road map. Yeah, it, it does. Yeah, help. I will actually put like uh, glow tape okay. on the top of the, the neck so that if the lights are out, you can still see where the fret markers are. Very yeah, good it, idea. It, it definitely is a big issue when you get in front of like a lot of lights. It, it's a whole different thing. I don't know if you're like me though. When when your guitar is a lot lower, it's hard to do a lot of really accurate alternate picking. Yes. You can still do your your hammer ons and stuff like that, but um, you know, and that's when I why I see you know actually even. Uh, slash is kind of that way he, he'll do his riffs and stuff low and then when he has to do something that's a little faster he'll sort of prop his knee up and then raise it brace it or, yeah yeah i've seen that, him do that yeah um, dustin derrico from pink is the same way like he'll put his foot up on the monitor when he's going to do something fast but uh you're right i mean there's a saying some somebody i forget who it was that, that said this to me he said uh let me grab my guitar here he said this is the uh this is the high register. Okay. And this is the cash, the cash register. Oh, I love that. <laughs> high register and cash register. That's well said. Yeah. <laughs> now, since you got that guitar, just for a quick second, I see you playing that one all the time. Tell us a little bit about that one. Okay. Well, this is my signature model from Prestige Guitars. Nice. Uh, basically, I wanted sort of a less polished type of guitar. Okay. Um, it has but a Strat configuration on the, so it's got two tones. And a volume that you can use your pinky on to do swells if you need to. Okay. Which uh, I love because on a traditional Les Paul, I always found that um, that the the, the the neck pickup is turned down, and then I go to do a, a neck solo, and, and suddenly my guitar was off, and I'd be like, Oh. Okay. So uh, one volume is all you need. The only reason you'd need two is is if you want to, you know, combine stuff. But who does that? Yeah, yeah. Right. No. Nope. That. Or if you want to do the you know the yeah Les Paul toggle. So that's why I put this. Your little kill switch. Nice. That gives that feature. Yep. Um, I'm learning to use this uh, more and more for different things, which is kind of cool. Uh, it's got a really cool 12 fret inlay. I don't know if you can see it. I can. It's the Rebel Alliance. That's so logo. cool. I'm a big Star Wars fan. Yeah. Big B, uh, Seymour Duncan pickups, and that's pretty much it. Yeah, but I love it. I love the color. The one F hole, um, it's hollow inside, so it has a kind of a, a cool sound, and play has great access to the upper fret. That's you fantastic. Can get up higher, higher than a Les Paul. I'm just gonna bring your camera down here just a little tiny bit here, so if I can, there, there we go. I got you fixed there. I um, I, I while back I changed strings for the very, very first time on a Bigsby. I'm a Floyd guy. I uh, most 90 percent of my guitars have Floyds. I got a few hardtails. My son here has a really nice Eastwood Airline uh, 3P custom 59 3P whatever three uh, three humbucker in it, and it's got a Bigsby on it. And never changed a Bigsby tremolo right or strings. And so what do I do? I go um, I go cut 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 them all off. And I watch a YouTube tutorial how to change strings on a Bigsby, and you know, I'm not I'm not afraid to admit it. I've just never used one. And it says step number one: don't cut off all the strings. And I'm looking at the guitar, and I, I see all the strings cut off. I'm like, <clears throat> and then I watch the, all these tricks. Okay, get a get a capo out and use a capo to clamp in. Blah blah blah. So I finally figured it out. But I added about 16 new words to the Canadian uh, slang swear dictionary. Uh, some of them are adopted to the U.S. as now as well too. But I was so mad. Now I can do it in five minutes, no problem. And I, I encourage everyone to try that. But man, what a yeah. frustrating experience! Yeah, I've, I've done the same thing. And in fact, just the other day, I'm still making mistakes. And you do about two, and you forgot to go under the little bar. Yep, I had it. So when you you got to redo it, and it's harder the second time. I know because the strings already kind of bent, and yeah. I thought I was going to try to invent something new because I mess it up so bad. Every time I would do a, a dive with it, it raised the pitch. I went the opposite way. <laughs> and I thought, hmm, do, right. I, do I tell my son that your dad's an idiot 
or do I say, look, we got this new technology. It's going to be a hit. When you bring the bar down, it raises a bitch. But I thought, no, I can't, I can't corrupt my son that way. So and right. he, he just knew I was an idiot anyways. He was watching me do it and he's hearing me curse and stuff like that. So there's a question from Rich. He says, uh, and I'm going to go back to the chat here in a second as well too, says question following up on our chat earlier today. Would love to know what type of audio out Corey uses to amplify the helix. That's a good question. Because you're using it for effects, right? And ah, okay. So I use the helix in a lot of different ways depending on the gig. If I if I got a big gig where I trust the sound man, I will split my guitar signal right out of the wireless. Okay. Two. And I will go one side, or I'll go mono into the camper, and then mono out of the camper, so the sound man gets that in mono. And then I'll recreate the exact same sound on the Helix and put all my time-based effects on that and and turn them all up to a mix of 100%. Okay. So just that. And that goes stereo to the salmon. Now the salmon has a mono sort of dryish signal and a stereo, you know, the Helix effects. Because what happens when you get a stereo, when you give stereo to a salmon, there's two guitar players. He automatically takes that stereo and he goes like this. Yeah, so now you've got everything to the left. It's not stereo anymore. I know. Right? So, like in a studio, if you have that situation, you'll have a mono signal usually, and you can put it anywhere in your stereo spectrum. Yep. And then you add stereo effects, which are hard left and right, to that, and then that makes it sound really wide. Well, now the sound man in live can also do that. He can put my mono signal anywhere, and without screwing with my effects. So essentially I have three outputs to front of house. With Helix, you can actually do that because there's so many dang outputs on this thing. Either the way they have the right? writing options, yeah. And yeah, because you can, the matrix of it, you can put so many different signals. I could, I could actually split the mm-hmm. signal within the Helix and take it out of three outputs and, and have it, you know, separate amp signals going to stereo out and then mono out. That's really cool, right? It is. Yeah. So I, I like the idea that would, in essence, it could give you that, uh, what I was tr- trying to incorporate in, well, actually, I do incorporate a lot in my sound, and I was doing it earlier with Native, to give you that uh, wet, dry, wet. It's nice to have a nice dry crunch up the middle. And I've done this a few times, and I'm going to do it again, just because it is cool here like when I do the shows. Um, as I mentioned, I've got the 51, whoops, the 5150 behind me, and I've got a 412 back there, and I've got a mic on one of the cones. And with Helix Rack, I mean, I know you can do this with Helix, uh, you know, LT or Floor as well, too. Um, but Helix Rack has a direct out, like a, like, I think it's like a, a buffer to whatever it is, like a, a straight out that you'd run to a tuner or whatever if you wanted to use an uh, you know, external tuner. But I would run direct out of that directly into my, um, uh, into the 5150's front input with no effects in it whatsoever. And then I'd have my left and right, uh, left and left and right uh, wet effects like delays, you know, uh, pitch detunes and all that kind of stuff. And then on my mixer, I would just bring in as much dry as I want. You know, it just to the point where, like, if you turned it off, it's like, okay, where'd that go? And uh, right. it, pretty darn cool as well. Yeah, that's a great way to do it. Yeah. And then if, you, if I was to do it now on Helix Rack, or I'm sorry, Helix Floor or LT, I would use one of the uh, one of the sends out of the back. I'd just send out some effects like that. And that would be kind of cool too, because some things you'd want to put, and I have done this, I'll put like maybe, let's say, like a phaser, a flanger, if I'm doing the Eddie school of approach, a wah pedal, you know, a couple things like that. I'd run that out and I'd put it in the in front of the amplifier and I just have my time base like delays and reverbs and things like that and the wet sound and it just sounds beautiful that's great yeah yeah and the reason why I say if I trust the sound man is because you have to trust him to make sure the effects are up in the mix right that's he right might just take the mono signal and go oh yeah it's great and, and if I was doing like gigs with two because we don't have a, like a, a, a sound man that's the same every time mm-hmm. um, you know the, the house sound man or whatever he might not know what I'm doing. So in that case, I just run stereo out of, um, of the Helix and you know, they they usually know what to do with that. And then I'm totally in control of the levels of effects. And that sort of thing. Yeah. Perfect. Well, that's good. Well, good answer there for rich. I'll see if there's any other comments over here in the chat as well. We have Kalen Provo jumping in. Uh, let me see. Shekius is here. Anki from Germany is jumping back in again here as well too, tuning in these shows in the afternoon like this work out nice for our European um, time zones and things like that. So that's fantastic. Um, Kai Down, who's a uh, big user of uh, the Helix products, he says, I've had so many issues with tube amps, microphonic tubes, different tone every day, hissy effects loops. 
not to mention analog pedal board noise issues. So glad to have the re- reliability of Helix. And I find that as well, too. I, I'm quite surprised that I am uh, where I am today with, with this digital gear because I was not that guy. I hated it with a passion. And as I mentioned earlier uh, today when I was doing the, the native demonstration, you know, I've got to give props where props are due. I was actually using a, a competitor's product for the longest time. I was using Bias FX and, uh, you know, a Bias Amp and stuff like that. And I still have it. I still have a license for that stuff. And it's still great stuff. But if I hadn't been for that, I wouldn't have discovered what else is out there. And, uh, you know, there's a world out there of stuff that is so inviting to try. And I think that's where a lot of people are afraid. They're just afraid to try because they're scared. Their, their comfort zone is their, their uh, boss delays, mine too, DD3s, you know, and all their favorite pedals and stuff like that. Just take a chance. Go to a music store. If you get a chance, you can. A lot of these places have places where you can buy them and have a 30-day return policy. If you don't like it, bring it back. Do it in the own comfort of your home because a lot of people like myself don't like to go to music stores and play. I, I get very intimidated by it. Just don't do it. So bring it home. Try it. If you don't like it, bring it back. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, there are so many guitar players who, like you said, are scared of technology, and maybe they maybe they don't understand it. And I understand there are people that you know, some people that get it, some people that don't. Um, and I'm actually thinking about starting a YouTube uh, channel that that addresses that, explains what MIDI is, how it can benefit a guitar player. You know, they most guitar players think MIDI is for keyboard players, but I use it on a regular basis. Yep. Uh, I, never, I never have to even use my wah pedal because MIDI is feeding it. I just play. I can be anywhere on the stage and never have to run back to my, my pedals to make sure I kick on a solo tone. Yeah. Um, it, it, I let computers work for me. And it's not as hard as people think it is when they get, like you said, intimidated by the whole thing. Um, but, you know, I love doing it. And uh, so I, I'm happy to share that in the I'm glad that you said that. And two things about that. Number one, I think that's an awesome idea. If you have the time to commit to it, I think that doing a a YouTube channel is phenomenal Um, and it'll benefit you in more ways than just doing that. I mean, it's obviously nice to, to provide tips, but it'll also be able, people will find you now and be able to discover your other music stuff you've done with Shania and, and, and Reba and everybody. And of course, Tuke as well too. So those will be icings on the cake. But the fact is that you're going to be helping a lot of people. And, and I'm not too embarrassed as well too. I like to, I like to tell people like the little skeletons in the closet when it comes to music stuff with me, because you know, people think I've experienced it all. There's hard, there's a lot of things I haven't experienced. I haven't experienced MIDI. I mean, it's been around forever and I, I'm, I'm 50, I'll be 51 this year. So I've, I've been in the music scene for quite a while. I've been when MIDI was first coming in, you know, probably even before my time, you know, I, it was there. I just, I, I was afraid of it. And here again, it happened to be this technology that got me involved in it. When I started getting power cabs, you know, the, you can maybe see you know, some of them behind me here. Um, I wanted to be able to change presets and uh, be able to change at the time I was using different uh, speaker models. So whether I was going to use like a, you know, a Celestian speaker model or even some of my impulse responses, I'd load into it. And when I had to change my preset, I didn't want to have to go over and change the amps, especially doing stereo. So I got to go, okay, hang on a second. Let me change that amp. Let me go to this amp. And thanks to Andrew at Line 6 and a few other people on the internet showing me how easy it was to send a command out of Helix. Uh, and if you're running a MIDI cable to one and you're using L6 cable to link them, it's just one touch and, and it's done. I was like, oh my God, this is so kindergarten easy. Yeah, so cool. I love that. Yeah, it really that's... opens up doors. <laughs> and and you know something else is really MIDI, fun? MIDI is a technology that's never changed. I know. Like USB, how many USB cables have, <laughs> are we on now? But MIDI's been the same damn thing for since its inception. It has. It so has. Like once you never have to worry about it. It's amazing. It's archaic, you know, but it's still. And, and I mean, look at too. I, I don't want to compare MIDI to MP3. You know, it's, we're talking, you know, a physical product to to uh, to a ta- intangible one. But MP3s, even though they're, the quality is not the best, they've been for almost since they first come out, right? You know, it just hasn't changed. You know, there's different codecs and things like that of, for for music right. sharing and and recording and that kind of stuff, compression. But it hasn't changed either. So well, don't fix what's not broke. Totally, yeah. yeah. I agree. And I think it'll, I think it'll be here for a long time as well too. Uh, so, uh, Kaylin there in the chat says, huge Tuke fan, uh, you rock, Corey. Um, let me see, continue ah. in the chat. Randy Tritt is here saying, hey, EVH, Sonia is here. Uh, Gary Davlin is here as well, too. Um, let me continue down, see if there's any other questions I might have missed. Uh, let me see here. A lot of people talking amongst themselves, which is always good. Uh, Randy Guitar Guitar is here as well, too. Um, let me see here. Might be down towards almost the end. I might have locked up on me as well, too. Oh, Brian Cote is here as well, too. He's another Helix user. Uh, let me see here. See if I missed anything else. Um, Joy Hervey, what strings and picks? Oh, okay, that's, that's a fair question. 
uh, from Joey Hervey says, what strings and picks do you like to use? Uh, obviously, that makes a big difference for people, myself included. Any preference that you have? I'm a big believer in the Diderio, just the regular ones that have been the XLs or whatever they're called. Nice. I used to use them when I was playing bars, mm -hmm. and I could get two weeks out of them, and they'd still sound, you know, halfway new. Right. Just by wiping them down with water at the end of the night. Okay. Um, if I use Ernie Ball or Boomers or that sort of thing, I get like half a set or maybe even three songs before they sound like they're completely dead. They die that quick for you. For me, they do. Yeah. You know, but I know a lot of people use them, but the Dario, man, they, they totally work up. Yeah, I'll go with them to the grave for sure. I'm glad to hear that. There, and have you tried yet the NYXLs? Uh, no. Okay, do yourself a favor, and I, I, I'm, I swear to God, you'll thank me after. Obviously, they're Diderio. It's um, a new technology that they're using. Was, I mean, not necessarily new, new. You know, these other people come out with these strings like the Cobalts and all these other kind of things like that as well, too. And, and Diderio had been working on the NYXL for such a long time. And I think someone scooped them on it, released a product similar. And then when Diderio come out with the, the string, a lot of people were saying, oh, they just copied so-and-so. Meanwhile, no, they didn't. I think they were the ones spearheaded this stuff. They're... I probably I don't want to quote prices, but they're they're probably about one and a half times, probably two times the price of normal set of guitar strings. But if okay. you think the regular and or the regular, you know, uh, um, the whatever the XLs or whatever they call them, the regular Dario brand, if you think those last long, I've got some on the, the ones. There's one Black Wolfgang I was playing earlier today that I changed back no, in November of last year. Uh, and I don't play it as much as, as uh, all my other guitars, but it does get played a lot. And I can strum on open chord right now, and it sounds like brand new strings. Now, I, and I always do wipe my strings off at the end of a, of a performance, like whether it's here or whatever. But try try them. And uh, I'll, it, are you, do you endorse D uh, Dario? I do, yeah. Okay, good. So then you probably work with Rob Cunningham there. He's one of the, he's a great guy. And if you don't work with him, um, I'll, g I'll get you in touch with him. Get I'll get you to I'll get him to send you some NYXLs just to try those. And you'll probably never play a normal string. Yeah, I had I had an incident with um, some coded ones. Uh, they were also the Dario, and my tech put them on and didn't tell me he was going to use them. Okay. And, and I was just like, "What is going on with my tone?" Like, I just I, and I and I never once thought it was the strings until I just had gone through every sort of element. Like, this just does not sound right. And I think I was blaming it on the Helix. He's like, "Well, maybe these things aren't all they're chalked up to be." And he goes, "Well, you know what? I put." I try and try new strings on your guitar. I'm like, oh, you got to tell me when you do stuff like that. Yeah. And sure enough, you put the XLs back on, and it was night and day. It was, you know, the other ones still sounded new, but there's some twang. It was, it was a. I had them on a on a telly, and so I needed that country twang for a certain gig. Yep. And um, so you know, I know how big of a difference strings make. I've just always loved the XLs, but I will definitely try, try the ones that you use. Yeah. Up. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell I'll tell Rob to, to reach out to you for sure because it'd be great to have. I, I, I love them to death. And you know something else? This is a funny thing too, and I don't endorse the brand. I, I just recommend it. I'm not, I don't get paid to say anything from them, and I'm not an artist or anything on their label, uh, but I love them. And another product I've used, have you ever tried, have you ever used over the years, and, and I hate to even talk about it sometimes because it's something I've never approached. Have you ever used string lube on any of your strings? Um, Back in the 80s, no, I, I don't typically no and you know it's funny and the back in the day you had like your fast frets and your uh, uh yeah. string string wife stringies or something like that fingeries yeah. Yeah. yeah all that kind of stuff right yeah. I, yeah. I hated it to death so i've yeah. been um doing some promotions with one of these companies uh local somewhat locally here um they're called lizard spit they make guitar polishes they make stuff for uh you know detail shops for cars and rims and you know detailing all that kind of stuff a really beautiful guitar polish but they sent me uh, several products to try, and one was their own version of String Lube. It's called uh, a Fresh and Easy. I had to think of the name for a second. And it comes in a like, little bingo dauber type thing, and it sat on my shelf for about four or five months. And I kept looking at it. I'm looking at it right now over there. And I'm like, I, I got I to gotta give these guys an answer on this, right? And I didn't even want to try it. I don't like String Lube just for anything. So I tried it on one of my guitars. I put on like a bingo dabber and it doesn't come out like a, this doesn't pour out, barely comes out. Is wipe it down the strings and then I take a cloth and I buff it off. And then anything, any residue that's left, which is barely anything, I wipe it on the back of my neck. There's no grease. It's not like, you know, chicken grease or something. And I tell you now, it's the product that I hated to try. It's a product that I can't live without. Another thing I would suggest to you, maybe not one of your touring guitars, maybe just a guitar you want around okay. the house, try it and see what you think of it. And it's it may it may kind of freak you out because it'd be something that you would have never probably wanted to try in your life. And for me, it was. And now I can't live without. It. It's one of those weird things. I'm running out. Of, I'm like, guys, you got to get me some more of this fast. 
You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. It's neat. It's neat. Well, but, but um, my tech recently turned me on to cornstarch. They'll put cornstarch in a little bag, like a, a cloth bag, cotton bag. Okay. And then I just kind of tap the bag in my hand, and it puts kind of a little, little talcum powder. Okay. So, and it totally soaks up the sweat and makes makes. And I use it a lot more for fiddle because fiddle is so temperamental. Sure. You are um, sweating, or if it's humid in the room, or if it's not humid, you like you're sl- every every place you put your finger because there's no fret is a new note. Yeah. So you have to have consistency there. So in order for that, for me to get consistency, you would just I would just dab this stuff in my hand, wipe it on my hand, and then it was very slick. Good. That works. Good tip. And I'm really glad you mentioned fiddle. I've seen some pictures of you playing as well, too. Obviously, electric. Um, this kind of reminds me back of a guest we've had on the show, too. Now, obviously not fiddle, but we're talking cello. Tina Guo, she she was on the show, and she's, you know, an electric cellist, just absolutely amazing. And she's using Helix and now Stomp and, you know, that kind of stuff for her uh, for her sound. Have, do you run Do you run the fiddle, so the same rig, Kemper and Helix? or is I, it just... Yeah. I run every instrument I play through the exact same signal chain. Nice. Um that's what's beautiful about this stuff is because all you have to do is turn off the amp. Yeah. You know, turn off the amp block. And now it's a direct signal. But throw in some reverb. I uh, use the loop because I like to use these uh, Fishman Aura pedals for my acoustic mm-hmm. instrument. Yep. So I'll put those in the effects loop of the Helix. Um, and, you know, then it just diverts it into that and I've got my acoustic sound. That is, that's yeah. phenomenal. And you only have to use one wireless pack as well, which is great. That's right. You're not changing that. I would I would assume that where a lot of guys or girls would just, you know, to make things simpler for themselves, they would just go into a DI into the board and let them control things. So if you can control it and send them a good signal, I mean, uh, that's the best of both worlds. Sound guys have so much to deal with. The last thing they want to deal with is your fiddle sound. I know. <laughs> so I know. what you give is what's going to come out front, you know, because he's always worried about drums and vocals. <laughs> yeah. So I like to make it really easy for them. Here's the signal. Uh, it's the, it's coming out at the same level as my guitar. You know, you make sure that everything's balanced. And there's a trick to doing that, but once it's set, it's set. You know, yeah. Don't worry about it. Are you finding more um, sound techs out there in the world of, uh, you know, from, you know, semi-professional to, like, uh, you know, clubs to touring, you know, places are being more receptive to, well, let's, we'll, we'll, we'll go smaller. We won't talk about the, some of the venues that you play, like some of these international, you know, stages and festivals and that, but maybe on a smaller level, do you find that, um, and maybe some of the, some of the, maybe the festivals, maybe that Tuke would play, we'll say, for example, you know, and I mean, I'm sure there's big ones as well, too, but are they more receptive to like, hey, uh, I'll give you two XLR outs from my Helix or my Kemper or whatever. Are they more receptive to that now than they might have been? They love it. They do. They love it. Even when you play in arena, mm-hmm. if you have an amp that's facing forward, chances are you're not going to be as loud in the in the PA. Gotcha. Because that is like an ear dart. Because some of the lower frequencies might not travel that far. Mm-hmm. High but that too. high mid, especially to the people in the front row, is going to be like an ear dart to their head. And the sound man, they always complain about that. So they'll say, can you turn that cabinet around? Or can you face it sideways? Or maybe we'll put it in front of the stage facing back at you. You know, um, they l- absolutely love these digital devices. You know, they'll, I'll just say I'm using two. Just give me two XLRs, you know, right by my mic stand or whatever. And they love it. Absolutely. Because they can control the sound up front a lot better now. That's good. That's good to know. Because I remember back in my day, this was long before. Well, I shouldn't say before modeling. I mean, we had back in the day, like the Digitech floor units and, you know, all these boss was still doing their thing back then. But it wasn't none of the companies that were doing it were in in a place where we are today. And I'm not just saying that about Line 6. I'm saying about everybody today. We are in a good place for modeling. But I remember with my group, I was kind of the, I'd be a, a, you know, a a stage sound guy. And I'd be like, you know, I was the guy that would tell the the sound guy, okay, we need this for the bass. We need this for the drums. We need this, blah, blah, blah. And I would have, I had a mini disc player that we'd play samples with. We were using backing tracks and stuff. And I'd say, okay, I need a DI for my mini disc. And then it was like, okay, my God, like you, you guys are like, who do you think you are, rock stars? You're like, it was hard enough to get a vocal mic sometimes, let alone asking for all these extras, you know? Right. So it's nice to see there's reception that way from people that are embracing it. And I guess it does. It's a better thing. People aren't getting blasted in the front rows. and One, one less live mic on stage, right? So one less mic that's bleeding other things. That's right. Uh, yep. Um, Whatever, and if you have a, a lead vocalist who doesn't sing very hard, mm-hmm. they walk by your amp. That gain's cranked up. They hate that. They hate that. Yeah. So digital revolution is uh, is quite amazing from the standpoint of everybody. That's true. 
and yeah, that's the thing too. I mean, the, I mean, being the, um, you know, an amateur sound guy for live, I, I know if the soul fact that quieter, you can keep that on the stage, the heck of a lot better mix you're going to get. Yeah. Clubs, especially because typically guys say, well, I can't get my tone unless I turn up my amp, you know? Well, your tone is, is deafening everybody in the first table. <laughs> that's right. Exactly. Nobody else can be heard. So, uh, and, and the owner's threatening to fire us. So you make the decision. <laughs> that's right. And people are going to say, I can't hear the singer. I can't hear the singer. Well, I'm, even though I'm a guitar player, it's the guitar player's fault. <laughs> the guitar player is too loud with that Marshall. Totally. Yeah. I'll just jump back to the chat for a quick second here as well, too. See if there's any other questions here. Uh, Ladybug is here in the chat as well, too. Um, see if there's any questions down as I scroll down. Chad Boston is here. You probably know Chad from uh, the Facebook group. He runs the uh, the one of uh, him and uh, Chris run the largest official Facebook group for Line Six Helix. Uh, like to over oh, yeah. 20, yeah, twenty thousand members now plus more so. That's great. Nice to see you, Derek Merrill. Uh, Mark Dillon is here. Landon the boy is here. We made it just in time. Um, so you kind of alluded to this. This is from Wood, Wooden. Whatever says, how do you get a full full sound with Helix? Any secrets to share? Maybe this is you can generalize this, and I, it was a question I had as well too. Maybe for some tips for some users. Now you're using it mainly for effects, but let's just say, uh, take Kemper out of the equation, and you're you're just going to run your full Helix one night. That's all you've got. Uh, they give you. And any tips you could suggest to people? Maybe cut back on here, and this is less is more, more is more. Any tips you could share that will get a good sound in a pinch? Quite often, people will um, will dial in a lot of effects like time-based effects, reverb, especially. Okay. You're at home, in the studio, or in your bedroom, wherever. Um, but once you get in a live situation, that stuff only masks your guitar. Because okay. you essentially have the reverb of the room now mm -hmm. already added to your sound after it comes out of the PA, right? So you're double time-based affecting your guitar signal. And anybody who, who knows what, if they've mixed a project before, as soon as you add, the more reverb you put on anything, the more in the, in the back it, it seems like it, it is. So if you wanted to poke out, a uh, dryer is always better. And, and if you're gonna if you're gonna go for anything, you go for more delays than reverb. That's what I was gonna say. Sure. Yeah. You can always you can always bring your mix back on the delays. So if you're if you're playing an indoor club, you're going to be getting some bounce back off the wall anyway. So you're not going to need as much. If you're outdoor, you could probably crank that mix of delays. But uh, I'm like that as well too. Just to have a bit of a slap back and ambiance. Like I was doing the demo earlier on um, on the Helix Native, and my my sweet spot. I know country is going to be a more of a fast slap back, but for me for rock, I like about a 250 millisecond for like a, my traditional uh, rhythm stuff. And then when I go into a lead, 350 almost like 400 milliseconds for a nice sustaining delay. I like that. But depending on the environment, yeah, m m more or less in the mix. So good point. Yeah, and, it, and that's a good you know you know to do the the dry. And the wet stereo left and right for sound men, if they get in an outdoor festival where there's no ambience at all, they can just bring that up. Exactly. Right? If they're in a in an arena, then they can bring that back depending on the room. So it's a lot of flexibility there. He, he doesn't have to ask you, hey, can you bring the, the reverb down? He can just do it. That's right. And what I learned, one of the probably one of the if I was to make a top three things I learned in the music business over the years, I'm gonna rate this in the top three for sure is please your sound tech. I'm not going to say sound, man, because there's some great uh, women out there that do the job um, uh, phenomenally. So your sound tech, impress them. What I would do, rule of thumb, what I would do, the type of band I played in, I was always an opening act for somebody, or I'm on a bill somewhere in the mix, whether we were opening up for a national act or we are just on bills with other people like ourselves. I'd walk in there and uh, maybe two bands are on, we're the third band, I walk in there, I see the sound guy, and maybe he's doing a great job, maybe he sucks. But I pat him on the back. I introduce myself. You know, usually take out a cotton bat and stick and hear you shake hands. Hey, that sounds great, man. Doing a great job. Boost their confidence right away. Uh, instead of being, yeah. yeah, I'm the guitar player with all the, f the six marshals. I need this mark, uh, mar you know, blah, blah, blah. No. B impress that sound person right away. And if you can make their job easier, your your band and you are going to sound like a million bucks. Totally. No, no, that's very good advice. If you, if you get down on a sound guy, <laughs> you're done. You're not going to sound. That's right. He's like, oh, guitar player will lip me off. Oh, well. Yeah. That feeder goes down. That, that's right. Oh, you, you <laughs> can't hear yourself, guitar player? You definitely can't now. <laughs> yeah. Definitely good to make an ally yeah. in the front of the house. 
That's right. Yeah. That's right. Uh, we're just about done. Uh, we're coming right up to the Helix Hour at 4 o'clock Eastern here. So I want to say hi to a bunch more people real quick here. Lost Smoke says, I use string droid strings. I can customize my sets and like them. By the way, I'm scared of technology, but you give me some hope. Awesome. That's what we try to do. Just kind of let, let people bring put these barriers down. Bring the barriers down and just try. You may, you may love it. You may not. But if you don't try, you'll never know. Like food, right? All these different recipes. Yeah. I gotta, I gotta kind of let some of my stereotypes get down, and I have a uh, a great chef here at home, Nocturnal. She makes some great stuff, and she's like, "Try it, you'll like it." And nine times out of ten, I do. Janice Lala is here. R two R three says XL are the best. I tried MYXLs, but too bright. Okay, just his opinion for sure. Um, let me see here. Kai Down, I love fast fret. I love finger ease, but I love the fresh and easy a lot. The pad on the top ripped off pretty quick, but it's great. Okay, now I haven't experienced that, but I don't press too hard on it when I use that. Uh, Quentin James says, I still use Super Slinkies, and Super Slinkies are my my secondary choice. I use those forever, so they are my second choice now. If I have like some extra strings kicking around, I'll use those. There is a Canadian company. Um, you, you may have, may have knew about them. They're, they're out of business now, but they're out of Windsor, Ontario. And at the time, this goes back in the early 2000s, they were called Firewire Strings. And it was the first endorsement I ever picked up as a professional musician, and they were phenomenal. I don't know if they made them themselves or had someone else make them, but they were a string that you just could not kill. Even the people that had this like really acidic sweat, you couldn't kill these strings. And then they went out of business, and it's such a shame. I'd I'd really like to find out if they made them or if someone else made them because I'd like to get the strings again. Um, Yeah. I never answered the the pick question either. Oh, yeah. I I just just use Fender Heavies, like the old celluloid kind. Okay. Uh, They wear down really quick, but they're great for pick scrapes. Nice. Those Tortex ones that are powdery feeling. Yeah, they're nice. Uh, last last forever, and they, they feel fine. You can hang on to them, but pick scrapes don't, they don't sound very good. Yeah. Pick scrapes. Yeah, I know. It's, it's often, often overlooked, and that's like what I do as, as well, too. I've got, I play two main picks. I use, I'm not sure if you've heard of these ones, these Davas. So the, okay. Yeah, Dava pick. Now, they have different styles, but this one depend, This one's called a Dava control. These ones, depending on where you hold the pick, you can actually get a different gauge out of it. So it's almost like a one gauge for all kind of thing. So that's kind of cool. But you only get yeah, that's cool. one good pick scrape out of these. And, and I mean, okay. it, they're, they're good because they'll get you a good pick scrape. But again, then again, you know, just put like 15 of them on your mic stand, and it'll, it'll be great, but they'll tear themselves up pretty quick. And then I use like the, uh, the uh, nylon EVH style picks as well, too. Those ones are nice for pick scrapes yeah. as well, too. And uh, they're nice, but we we all overlook that sometimes. If a good pick scrape sounds pretty good at the right time, I have a good pick scrape. First That's right. And foremost, <laughs> that is right. Uh, let me see if there's anything else I can mention because we're wrapping up here in just a moment. I don't want to miss anybody if I can help it. Uh, Gussie Wells is here as well too. David Forbes, uh, hybrid slinkies for me uh, for drop tuning. Good suggestion. Uh, let me see here. If I, I just don't want to miss anybody if I can help it. Rick Hyatt is here. Uh, what's up, Eric? Rock on. Uh, all the guitar players. Uh, uh, Lost Smoke says, great show. Got a roll. Dog crying for walk. And we know what that's like. Gary Holt is here, my buddy from L.A. Uh, nice to see you. And let me see here. Elizabeth Higgins is here. Great interview. Love to. Very, very nice. And I don't know if I missed anybody else. I think that is probably it. So let's just talk about, uh, so to recap again here too, you've got the single coming out. May, was it May 3rd, you said? Uh, May third, exactly on okay. Friday. This coming Friday. Fantastic. Yep. And, and what is what's releasing the album in the summer? The oh, fantastic. Yeah, so we'll have the full album uh, and CDs pressed as well. So that'll be cool. Very good. So the physical CDs we can have. Anything else uh, throughout 2019? Obviously, you can be some big summer festivals. I'm assuming. I got a show I'm I'm rehearsing for right now, but I'm not allowed to say what it is at this point. But okay. uh, it'll come out soon enough. But that that'll happen in the summertime. Um, and uh, and I'm just producing until then. Now, are you still currently touring with Shania, or, or is that are you, are you off now, or how's that working? We're, off. We're currently off. We did a whole tour last year, mm-hmm. uh, and we probably will start up again in December-ish. And so, uh, looking forward to that. It's always great to be in her camp. Great, great, fantastic artist. Absolutely. One of those champions, you know, I'm, I'm not a real country music fan. I did play a small stint in a, in a country band with Van Halen striped guitars. It was a very weird gig. It was like Waldo. <laughs> oh, yeah. And all night long, uh, I had my my foot over my distortion pedal or my lead channel. Just the other day, I think we did uh, Fast As You by Dwight Yoakam or something like that or something like that. And I was the guy that got to do the lead on that one because we had two guitar players. And, and it was just the weirdest thing. But people like Shania Twain and Reba, of course, as well, too, um, are the champions that kind of 
bring you to that uh, genre if you never would have maybe ever discovered them? Obviously, like your other big classics, but they're kind of the champions and the, the household names that will cross people over, I think. Absolutely. I mean, if you look at any of our live videos on YouTube, uh, we cross the line quite frequently right into like almost metal, to be honest. Nice. Well, that's the thing. Like I, one of my guitars is tuned down to like a low uh, freaking a sharp on the low E string or something like that. And, uh, and I, I have, I almost have bass strings on it and it's like, it's to get the exactly. Kind of yeah. Chugging. Well, th- yeah. that's what you like. It. A lot of people will say, Oh man, that country player in that band, you know, like so-and-so, so-and-so they're, they're shredders, man. Like what, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, you don't realize it. That almost goes back to what you said earlier about wearing the guitar here or here, the high register and the cash register. You know, sometimes metal and, and, and shredding and all that kind of stuff, you know, it's hard to get these gigs. But, you know, you go where the, where the gigs are, and uh, that's why a lot of these guys like yourself and girls out there that can shred that are in a country band, it's just, that's just one of the other, that's the gig they have that day or month or year. Absolutely. That's the way it works yep. out. Yeah, if, if anybody w- watches Red Storm on YouTube, just check out Red Storm. Okay. Uh, you'll see it, and that's, that was during a Shania show. You'll, <laughs> you'll get... How far to the uh, other side we actually go from country? Nice. I'll look that up for sure. That'd be great. I can't wait. But, I mean, country music these days is just pop music with a country singer. I agree 100 percent on that. Yeah, because I'm, I'm finding I can listen to more of it where I couldn't. Yeah, I I get that for sure. Well, listen, we are right at four o'clock sharp. This was perfect. Ray ended up right on the Helix Hour. Man, it was a fantastic uh, 60 minutes with you. It's been a pleasure. I want to thank you so much for your time and sharing some of your valuable knowledge with us and, and uh, you know, guitar knowledge and Helix knowledge and, and everything else. Just a real pleasure. I'll say goodbye to you off the air, and I wish you the best. We'll be checking out on the third there with that new single coming out. Can't wait. We'll share that as well, too. And I want to thank everybody for jumping in the live chat as well, too, and participating and uh, being patient with us for some of our shows where we've lost some internet. But it's a, it's a great time. And we, uh, Game of Thrones tonight, are you watching Game of Thrones? Absolutely. It's going to be a good Won't one. Miss it. After tonight, oh, yeah. we have three more episodes. Isn't that hard to believe? See, you know, I thought that they were actually going to do more episodes because it took them so long to get this season out. Yep. So it's going to be like a double season. Oh, well. I think what they've done though is they've they because we watch it after the fact we stream it after and without the commercials and stuff like that and it's like it's about 60 some odd minutes so I think it's each episode is longer than it was before oh. or no much longer than 60 minutes might be like 90 or something like that so I think they've made less episodes but longer and almost like a full length feature but okay cool did you right. did you and as we wrap up did you see Avengers yet? I haven't been yet. No, I'm excited to go for sure. It's good. Have Ju- you? Junior and I saw that last night and I won't say anything about it other than everything that they're saying good about it. It's that and that much more. So we can, we can get to wrap up on a, on a geek note of Game of Thrones and uh, <laughs> adventures. All right, listen, I'll say goodbye to you off the air. Don't go away. We'll say goodbye. And everyone, thank you so very, very much. We will see you next time right here on this channel. Until then. Cheers. Hey, you're still here? Eric Jr. here, reminding you to check out our full lineup of quality merch. Available right now in the Broadstash Boutique. Quality products and fast shipping. Visit Broadstash.com today. Thank you for watching the Helix Hour. We hope you enjoyed today's presentation. An extra special thank you to the staff at Line 6 for their continued support. If you've not yet subscribed, please do so right now and feel free to share our content with your friends. See you next time on the Helix Hour.